morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all, depending on which corner of the sore but beautiful planet you are in now. Welcome to Pollinations, Peasant Talks for Food Sovereignty. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. I am Mateusz Costa Santos, part of the LVC Africa team, speaking to you from Maputo, Mozambique. And today we present to you Africa and to the world our debut uh, of our Agroecology Achieves Food Sovereignty series. This is a collaborative effort between Via Campesina Africa and AFSA, and it takes shape in the form of a collection of interviews with African leaders of social movements, uh, civil society experts, and other others engaged in the agroecology and food sovereignty movements in Africa and the world. Here we will debunk myths and clarify truths about the African food system, discuss why and how agroecology and food sovereignty can provide answers to Africa, and why this is so important in this moment. So let's dive right in. For today's episode, we are honored to have with us Elizabeth Mpofu, a member of Zimsof uh, and LVC Africa and the current coordinate, general coordinator of Via Campesina internationally, speaking to us from Shash in Zimbabwe. We have Milian Belay, uh, director of the AFSA Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa Secretariat, speaking to us from Ethiopia. Hank Hobeling from the Grain team, our dear comrades, uh, in the struggle for food sovereignty, speaking to us from Holland. Liz Holden from Gaia Foundation. Elizabeth Mpofu, Mama Elizabeth for us. Please tell us, uh, from your perspective as a peasant, far, a peasant leader in a global movement as Via Campesina, and also as a farmer yourself, uh, who are Africa's food producers and consumers? How is our uh, African food produced? Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity. First of all, I want to greet you all and just to mention that I am the co-founder member of the African Women Collaborative for Healthy Food Systems because what we are discussing now is more of how our food is really being produced and how we really want to link with the agroecology farming systems. Coming back to your question, we know very well that the majority of food producers in Africa, they are the small-scale farmers, the peasants. And the larger percentage are the women who are always on the farms, who are always trying to produce food to feed the families, to feed the nation, and also to see that each and every citizen in Africa is enough food to put on the table. Regardless of the challenges which we face as the rural women who are producing food, we know very well that there is quite a big competition with the industrial farming systems. But what we are aiming at is that we really want to feed our people, to feed Africa with the good, healthy food, which we produce agroecologically, organically, without using on of any any uh, these inorganic fertilizers. So, in most cases, you find that the women and the young people they are the people who are always on the farm, who are always suffering, who are always uh, facing these challenges. We look at the climate change. It's affecting those food producers. We also face the policies that are not really in support of the Sorry, of sorry, the Mama women. Elizabeth. Uh, yes. Before you go further on that question, let me let's let's just tie it back a little bit and build the context a little bit more before we we dive into public policies. Liz, how do you see food as a cultural process? What is the link between food and culture? Well, food is at a very critical central, plays a very critical central role in the food system of human beings around the planet, of different cultures around the planet. And it tends to be women who've cultivated this huge diversity of seed over generations. 
And seed is not only food. Seed is also for, for celebration, for ritual, for rites of passage, for marking changes in human life, just as seed has its own cycle of producing food, of producing um, the fruits and the, the harvests, and then going back into producing seed. So it symbolizes a cycle of life. It symbolizes how life works, both in nature and in humans. So seed and food have always and continue to play a very central role. But I think what's important and what's lost in the modern world is that there's a very deep spiritual relationship, uh, particularly amongst the women who have cultivated the seed. Because for them, seed is, is part of them. For, for them, having seed is like part of who you are. And seed is such a profound symbol of life. And so seed is a sacred, a sacred element in, in cultures around the world and has been traditionally until the modern conception of, of seed emerged. So seed is very central and it's very central to the human cycle as well as to the, the cycles of life in nature. And that's the mm -hmm. connection. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Liz. Tell me a little bit more about, uh, like historically, how uh, there's, uh, of course, we come from those roots and somehow those roots exist in our society in different geographical points still, but there's a, there has been an evolution to the global food system, a globalization of, or an industrialization of this system. Can you explain to us how has how has this evolution took place and, and was there what was the turning point where was the turning point and why well a critical turning point was after the second world war when uh, in europe when there were all these war chemicals that the industries needed to decide what to do with and so these war chemicals were turned into the toxic chemicals and fertilizers today that are used in the food system And so the, the agriculture, the seeds, people who were producing hybrid seeds then started to link the seeds to the chemicals, to the fertilizers. And this was first introduced, the Green Revolution, as it was called, was introduced first in Asia and then later in Africa. But the devastation of putting toxins into the soil, drying the soils, toxifying the waters, It's also linked with reducing the crop diversity so that you, you develop a few hybrid seeds, really reducing the diversity that are linked to the chemicals sold by the corporations. The farmers de become dependent on buying the seed and the, and the chemicals linked to the seed. That toxifies the system, it dries out the, the soils, as I've said, and then they become dependent because it's just a, it's an ongoing cycle of, of creating ever greater dependency as the ecological system is toxified and dried out. And so in, in India, um, that led to farmer suicides because farmers were so in debt. In Africa, a similar trend is happening. Uh, with climate change, of course, this is, it goes against the systems of nature because with climate change, you need to enhance diversity. Um, and that's where the crunch is coming now because the traditional crops are obviously far more resilient in the face of instability of climate. But when you strip your soils through using chemicals, then the whole system becomes much more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And Liz, uh, tell me a little bit, like in parallel to just, just as we probe further, uh, like how, how does that relate to the hunger figures over time? This, this, because I believe this, the system was proposed to solve the problem of hunger of the world, this industrialized system. So how, how have the figures actually performed over time? Well, over time, as, as we know, the figures, the hunger is increasing because of the dependency of the farmers on having to, to buy cash, I mean, to buy their seeds and their input all the time. But because you're stripping the system of its resilience and of its fertility, So initially with the Green Revolution, the, the uh, productivity went up because you were forcing the system with chemicals. But now when you destroy the very, the very foundations of your ecological system, then the figures go down and the productivity goes down 
and and that is what is is increasing especially with climate change now it means that less food is produced if when there's uh, climate change hits we're seeing that the maize and the other crops are just not able to produce Thanks, Liz. I wanted to stay on this issue of hunger a little bit and uh, move over, like seeing it from a uh, public uh, public policy perspective. Million, there uh, there has been uh, there have been many like main paradigms of approaching the issue of hunger, uh, and I wanted to ask you. Uh, if you could tell us first, I'm, I'm going to break this into two questions. First, uh, is if you could tell us the main differences between the concept of food security, the concept of the right to food, and the concept of food sovereignty. I'm asking you this because I wanted to hear from you. Where is what is your initial evaluation or your the perspectives on on the, the the setup, the actual policy setup of Africa as it stands now, and what is it that we need uh, as, as speaking to, to these three concepts? If I start by uh, answering the last uh, mm -hmm. question in terms of setup, I think in most of the uh, documents, uh, in most of the policy documents, um, food security is much more emphasized than right to food and food sovereignty. Uh, the main documents and CADAP and the Malabu Declaration and in African Union and in almost all governments in Africa, the word food security is very much emphasized. Um, the right to food, yes, it is there in the document, but it's not actually exercised. Um, so. Uh, food security, in short, it talks about uh, availability of food. Food should be available, should be accessible both economically and physically. Uh, it should be usable, you know, um, useful to, to people. And it, it has to be st uh, stable, you know, it has to be there all the time. But now, currently, um, other elements like uh, agency and sustainability are included. Um, but uh, the, the the similarity food uh, with food sovereignty, food sovereignty doesn't quarrel with increasing productivity. It doesn't quarrel also with the link between food and health. Um, access to food also is one of the agendas for food sovereignty. But food sovereignty uh, goes much deeper into the agenda of food. And food security, um, it's, it's neutral. Food security is neutral to the power asymmetric issue. Who controls our food system? Uh, what are the kinds of systems that they use to control our food system? Uh, where is where where is the food system being led right, right now by um, countries, uh, big corporations, um, uh, philanthropic capitalists? Where is the transformation directed to? That's a very, very important question. Uh, and, and food sovereignty raises that question. It talks about uh, small-scale farmers, fisher folks, pastoralists, indigenous people, producing their own food, uh, controlling their own market, and also producing in a way which is friendly to the environment, to the biosphere, you see? Uh, food security does not say anything about that. You know, it's just food produced and consumed. The right to food is a very, very interesting uh, concept. There's some danger in it, but um, as it is imagined now, the right to food is for governments to make sure that uh, food security is is uh, secured, rather, you know. So, uh, right to food is, you know, uh, obliges government to ensure that there's access to food, food is available, and the food eaten is, is useful, um, and it's produced in a sustainable way. But um, some governments take this de definition to, to use the industrial agricultural method or high input method to increase food, the availability of food. So you have to ensure the right to food to ensure that the kind of production that you should do is increase production only uh, under the productivist paradigm or a productivist narrative. 
So it can corner people into or governments into the productivist paradigm. But the food sovereignty is a much more comprehensive and right-based agenda uh, because ownership of the means of production and economy, um, cultural appropriateness are all included in food sovereignty and it's the agenda of the people also. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Milan, I wanted to uh, just go a little bit deeper here. Now, linking this uh, this um, conceptual uh, discussion to the actual practice of agriculture. So, you've mentioned the issue of productivism and the drive to increase yields of specific crops as the main. Um, uh, it's it's like the main indicator of success. Yeah. Uh, in this um, industrialized, globalized system that we the or predominant logic really so there's clearly an element of ecology that's missing there as brought up very clearly by liz uh, the the, there's a a paradox that you want to produce more but you're destroying more to produce more so when uh, agroecology is one of the main uh ideas that uh that came that came about from the peasant movements as an alternative view on how to produce the food to achieve food food sovereignty and how for you how how does those fit in how does agroecology fit into this discussion yeah you see the productivist paradigm forgets one very important thing which is what is the purpose of food what huh? what is the purpose of food is it uh, or uh, uh, the, the, what the, what's the purpose of the food system in general Is it to have more food on your table? Or is it to have nutritious food? More food than nutritious? Or is it to have healthy food? Is it to produce uh, without impacting your environment, your biosphere? Is it to produce culturally appropriate food? Is it to produce in a, in a right way where people's right is not violated in the, in the process of production? So all these questions are forgotten by the industrial food system. So that's a very, very central question in terms of agroecology. Agroecology takes all. And people say that agroecology is going back and we have been practicing it. No, agroecology endorses science. But what kind of science is a question, uh, but endorses science, people's science. It's, it's, it's a highly knowledge intensive agroecology. And agroecology is supported by uh, by people, by the social movements, by the society, uh, because of the impacts of industrial agriculture, you know, impact on health, impact on uh, nutrition, impact on environment, on our culture, you know, destruction of our culture on the rights. That's why the paradigm of agroecology is winning. That's why more and more people are recognizing agroecology. And the recognition of agroecology in Africa is increasing. It's not to the level that we want now. It's uh, still at its, its infancy, but we can see that there are huge changes in other parts of the globe. And hopefully that thinking, that uh, change in that direction will also impact our continent. And um, it's impacting our continent and there are uh, policy initiatives. If I want to give you a, a, an example, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, as you know, is starting um, a food policy discussion in over 20 African countries. This will happen in the coming few months. And each of these countries would gather civil society, farmers, you know, food producers in in general, um, people from the academia, uh, from government, from some entrepreneurs, and they will come together and think about the kind of food food system that they are having at their country level and what the vision of that country is. So all of these country level discussions will come together um, and and there will be a parallel process of uh, discussion at the African Union level. And all this will be synthesized and there will be a policy proposal um, uh, from the people. For the first time in the history of Africa, a policy proposal will be presented uh, to the African Union uh, to endorse uh, the, a more sustainable future for Africa. 
Thank you very much for bringing that up, sharing that uh, exciting news with us, Milan. And you touched on an important point, which is also the aspect of democracy within the food system. Yeah. And I wanted to come to bring Hank into this now. Uh, Hank, uh, many global corporations and some governments are coming out of this pandemic media cloud with brand new agroecological transition and regenerative agriculture strategies, which promotes the use of agroecology within the industrial farming model. My question to you is, is there a revolution underway in the industrial agroecological system <laughs> model? Thanks, uh, Mateus. My short answer to that question would be, <laughs> if there is a revolution, it's a revolution among the PR spinners, the public relations people of the big corporations, and it's certainly not happening, not that revolution in the fields. But to put your question a bit in a broader context before I give you a few examples on, of indeed how the corporations are um, trying to um, um, occupy and to appropriate the proposals by Via Campesina and by many of us around agroecology and food sovereignty. Um, just a general com comment to put your question, question into context. One, and also the question you asked about uh, hunger before. One key element in the whole question of food production is access to land. And we know in Africa it, it's a huge problem and, uh, and across the world as well in different ways and formats. A few years ago at Kremi put out a report which showed that about 90% of all the farmers are small-scale farmers, are peasant farmers. And they only occupy less than a quarter of all the farmland. Mm. And that's a process which is increasingly small-scale farmers get increasingly pushed off their land, have to do with less and less land, have to work on less and less land, and uh, which is also causing that more and more the issue of hunger and of being able to produce enough food is there, really. So for me, that's, that's, that's a very important question. If you look at the corporations, what we have seen over the last decade or two is there has been a huge move I think it was started in the in the previous financial crisis in 2008 um, that the corporations, agribusiness, but also new phases like the banks, investment funds, and what have you, started suddenly seeing land as a commodity they could make profit from. So we saw a huge um, move in what we call land grabbing, uh, especially focused on Africa, where companies came in to create huge plantations to be able to produce commodities which they could sell on the international market. And I think the first conclusion there is, we always talk about food production. It's important to realize that these companies, many of them, they don't produce food, they produce commodities to be traded somewhere and to be incorporated in, not only in food products, but also in, in biodiesel, in what have you, uh, and sell that across the world. So that's an important uh, thing to realize. Um, what happened uh, in that whole process is that more and more people started asking questions about the sustainability of these big industrial uh, food system models and the big plantations. And also in the context of climate change, we know that these, uh, th these huge plantations cause an enormous problem with soil erosion and therefore also uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Apart from the whole question, how the industrial food system, by moving food around the world like as if it were a travel agency, uh, again, a lot of uh, climate uh, emissions are, are taking place. So in that context, these corporations got more and more questioned in that whole model by not only uh, groups like Via Campesina and like us and others, but it became an, a problem for these corporations that they were being put in such a bad light. So what we saw is a reaction to this, <clears throat> and this only st this started uh, in a, in a serious way, in a strong way, only just a few years ago, that these corporations start forming coalitions amongst themselves, start forming new bodies, in which they um, call for a change in the food system, more sustainable, and in which they also incorporate agroecology and uh, sustainable farming into their plans, and they declare to the world that this is. Uh, the new way the companies are going to work. What I find most striking, I think it was last year, the head of um, Danone, called Emmanuel Faber, 
last year in New York at the, at the site uh, of the of the summit on climate with the Hatton. He was giving a speech where they ba he basically declared on behalf of his own company, but also on this new coalition they were launching there, together with Nestle, together with also um, chemical fertilizer companies like, like Yara, um, that they were going to take biodiversity and agroecology. They were going to take the, make that the center of their operations. And this, that, that speech is worth looking at. It's amazing because he uses a lot of the discourse that we tend to use. He basically declared that the current food system is broken. It doesn't function. He referred to hunger in the world. He referred to that there's a huge problem in getting the food on the table. He referred to there's a huge problem with the laws of biodiversity. And he referred to that there's a huge problem with the environmental uh, issues and with climate change. So he put that whole that, that new strategy into that context. Their, uh, their, their new coalition is called on One Planet Business for Biodiversity Initiative. And, um, and that's the kind of uh, proposals they put on the table. What's interesting there, of course, is yes, they talk about um, agroecology, which I would call agroecology light. It's a very undressed way of agroecology, and it's of course totally disconnected from the food sovereignty as we are and, uh, and donors are, are, are defending it. So it talks about cleaning up production methods, um, look at the soil fertility and how you can improve that. It looks at a number of techniques and how to do that. It's very narrowed down just and only on farming methods, which then these big companies like Danone and Nestle want to transmit to their farmers, to their suppliers to, impl to implement. But of course, nobody asked the question and especially not them, it's like, wh how, what do we do in the future with all these new expanding plantations which produce soybeans, which produce all these industrial crops, which take lands away from small scale farmers and produce materials, commodities, which people cannot eat, or which are used especially to feed the industrial livestock operations in many parts, of the, which are growing in many parts of the world. So I think that contrast there, and yes, they are co-opting, they are using the language we tend to use uh, is is clearly there. Another example, and I don't want to make this too long, is uh, the, the uh, at around the same time, a new coalition of the same companies, plus some NGOs uh, and and other companies as well, was launched, which is called the Food and Land Coalition. And again, it sounds like okay, we corporations are now aware of the huge problem we have with land. Uh, it, it's badly managed, it's badly used, and we're going to change that. And again, they come with proposals, they go to uh, to UN meetings and propose that agroecology should become more at the center of food production. Now, what the, the, the one thing I just want to add there, to put that in the context, and that's why I think it's so important to have this conversation, is, is uh, what they do is they undress the whole idea of food sovereignty, of, of agroecology, and de-link it from the need for a broader restructuring of the of the global food system and including their own role thank you uh Hank. Uh, liz i wanted to bring you back to this as uh as we're coming to a close here um can you tell us a little bit Hank? you you spoke about uh about the elements that are chosen to be part of this uh, new corporate strategy But uh, I wanted to ask Liz if you want to pitch in something into this discussion and also if there's any uh, jumping uh, elements that you see that are not being included. Why are they the bad cherries? <laughs> uh, which are those? What are the elements of agroecology that really don't fit? And I'm trying to get at if you think this is deliberate and why would that be so? The key issue is about farmers controlling their own systems and that food is not a commodity. It's been turned into a commodity by these corporates. But as we started to say, food is, is something that is so central to human, human life in terms of celebration, in terms of rituals, in terms of rites of passage. So it's, it's at, the, at the heart of how we relate as humans It's culturally, it plays a, a hugely important role. So when you have the corporate saying they're going to do this, you know, a nice agroecology technique, they're not talking about where the decisions are made. 
and and they're still talking about food as a commodity. And with climate change, this becomes even more critical that that very intimate relationship that the women and the men farmers have with the seed, with reading the what is happening with climate, with adapting to climate, you'll see what's happening, how because of climate instability, the women who are reviving their seed diversity are planting more diversity so that more will survive, so that they'll get some crop. Well, if you reduce just to this one crop linked to a chemical that you're growing on a huge scale and you're selling to Unilever or whatever, you, you just become a slave to the food system. So it's stripping the, the, the farmers of their knowledge, of their control, which is so critical now in terms of climate change, but also of their whole identity and the relationship that they've had you know, for generations developing this fantastic diversity of cultural food that's full of meaning and full of some symbol. And so I think that that for me goes to the key of this thing, is it's still the, the agroecology speak of the corporations is still within the centralized control of food as a commodity. And, you know, what all of us are doing are trying to take back control of the food system, enable farmers to take back control, but also that knowledge becomes even more critical now, that fine knowledge that farmers have in order to produce food. And, and so that's, that is the next frontier of the appropriation of farmers' ways of life, is to really take further control of farmers' knowledge by literally dictating what they should plant and how they should plant it. And so, you know, and this issue of power and control is a very profound one. Mm -hmm. And Liz, uh, this is not an issue of the global south alone, right? Now, now, especially in Europe, there's many discussions, many, many questionings and many uh, processes that are at, at play to try to transform this picture in Europe as well. In the UK, for sure, you have, you've, uh, um, I've been aware of uh, many developments in the agricultural sector, especially and interesting by brought by Brexit and what does it mean to live outside of Europe? What the, what about our food now? Now that's a question, right? So that's, that's uh, I just wanted to say that to, to mention that this, this question, this, uh, this is a dilemma that the whole world is living through yeah. and uh, yeah. re coming back to that reality, that, uh, that spirit of food as it were. I think just, uh, on, just on that, mm. if I can just say, I think also, you know, crisis is opportunity. And this COVID thing has really shown, you know, the, the dreadful cracks and disparities in the whole global system. But around the food issue, people have really got the message that when in crisis, if you've got a relation with your local farmers, your local food producers, your local shops, that's what's happened as a, as a consequence, is that, that those relationships of, of where you get your food and how you get it and between the producers and the people who eat food, globally, that's been a wake-up call. And, and that's something that I think we really need to build on because your food must be local and seasonal. That's the ultimate resilience and security in multiple crises as we're in now. Thanks, Liz. Emilian, you, you still have uh, something to add? Um, maybe a little bit. I think the uh, big question is, why are companies changing their tune now? Um, I think uh, they are seeing the, the, the writing on the wall, as they say, uh, because the uh, consciousness of consumers is rising all over the world. Uh, people are talking about food, as Liz was saying. That's a very much important thing. And the big policy initiatives, and with all their um, weaknesses, are springing up both in the US and also in, the, in, in Europe, like the, this Green New Deals. Green New Deal in the US, Green New Deal in, the, in, the, in, the, in Europe. We know that they have a lot of weaknesses here, here and there. But in general, their, their direction, uh, you can say that, that, uh, that they have some radical elements in them. Um, the Greta effect, you know, the Greta Thunberg effect, you know, the youth are now 
having huge questions. And Liz was also participating in this Extinction Rebellion uh, thing in, <laughs> in, in the UK. With you. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of public, public opposition, public movements are there. Even the Pope, the Pope, um, I think uh, he has uh, produced the Laudato Si. In that mm-hmm. Laudato Si, it was very, very clear that the future of our world, I think uh, we have to change some course. Otherwise, we are going to crisis. So the, all this energy is coming in. A lot of research is out. A lot of research. I think much more than that. And big events are happening. With all, again, with all their weaknesses, you know, the aid conference in the global level for the future of food. Yeah, and AFSA by itself, you know, we have small food system discussions and policies. A lot of food system level discussions are coming. And even at FAO, people are talking about food uh, systems and nutrition. That, that was not the agenda before. So the food system and nutrition in general, this agenda is coming. So they cannot ignore all that. So they have to have a way out of this uh, this um, energy which is, is happening all over uh, all over them. And the Peasant Rights Declaration itself, Milan, which yes, is, I think, exactly. a major achievement in that direction, exactly. of recognizing the food producer and the people living and working in the land. Yes, exactly. So, Yes, I agree with you. The movement, uh, the, the something, something is brewing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I yeah. add to something there, uh, uh, Mateus? Just uh, hey, yeah, I'll just... give you two minutes because we need to close this first okay. episode, this inaugural episode of our series, and I want to still give a last word to Mommy Elizabeth. Uh, take your minutes. Please, okay, hey. two minutes. This sounds very good. I'll, I'll, I don't even need two minutes, I think. But just to follow up on what Million was saying, I agree. The, the movement side is getting stronger. And the general realization that the way we're heading with our food system is going in a disastrous direction. And the people realize that. So, yes, the companies are worried. And that's why they're moving to co-opt our terminology and to co-opt our ways of uh, discussing things. Um, whether they are successful, because in all these uh, fora, which M- uh, Million was mentioning, uh, they are very active as well. Just to look at the upcoming Food Systems Summit, the fact that the, the UN wants to talk about food systems rather than just food is very interesting. But of course, this has been, again, totally um, uh, put in the framework of the World Economic Forum. They put the leader of AFSA as the lead person in this process. And, and Agra, again, and you mean? <laughs> Agra, indeed. <laughs> and they are marginalizing all the efforts of, of civil society organizations who have, for 10 years, been mobilizing around the FAO and in, in, um, in the civil society, civil society mechanism there. But is this just to say that, uh, yes, I think it's very encouraging. We have to be very vigilant and clear about the rhetorics and the aggressive uh, pushes, which are now coming from the corporate sector, because I agree, it is, they realize they have a lot of st- at stake. They might they might be losing their credibility, and especially the food companies, you know, those whom the names on the yogurts and the milks and the, the, the companies who are visible to the public are very careful to paint themselves in a very positive light in this whole food system, while changing nothing. And I think that's important to realize. <laughs> Thank you very much, because business is good, right, Hank? Totally. Uh, <laughs> to all of you out there, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, watch out for the second episode coming out of, as we continue to unpack these discussions. Mama Elizabeth, I wanted to come back to you as we are coming to a close of this first round of discussions. While the COVID moment sweeps, has swept and continues to sweep through our territories, none of the uh, preceding conditions that we've lived through uh, have ceased to exist. We know that you in Zimsoft, your organization, have been for a number of years developing very inspiring agroecological experiences, including in your home, the the Shashe Agroecological Block. How's the climate in Shashe? And how has the community and fields been faring uh, under these lockdown days? Give us some good news, Mama, please. Thank you, Mateus. Thank you once again. Just to give you a little bit ground of <coughs> the situation uh, about this, the climate in Shashi. Right now, as you are aware, the way we have been uh, 
it is in our agroecology farming systems. We used to gather, to have social gatherings, to prepare our uh, traditional ceremonies before we go to the farm after harvesting. But given the situation right now, due to this lockdown uh, caused by this COVID-19, it's so differently now. We are trying our best to concentrate more on our work. We don't stop as farmers, but now we are not able to gather. We were supposed to have our seed fairs, our food festivals in our areas, but now with limited a number of people, we cannot manage because the government has stipulated that not gathering of more than 50 people. So it's a big challenge for us because we used to have so many people coming to us to see exactly what we are doing at Shashe. But also, this is also an opportunity for the farmers because we are not waiting. Each and every farmer is busy on his or on a half farm preparing for the coming season. Regardless of how we are going to get our seeds, we used to gather and exchange seeds, but now it's going to be possible, impossible. But we are not waiting to tell you the truth the lockdown has given us a very big opportunity to see who is your friend, who is your best friend, who is your neighbor, who also hears or also tries to understand the challenge which you are facing. We have disabled people who really need much of our assistance because they used to go to the buses on the streets to beg. But now it is our role which we are playing in the communities to see that these people, they also have food to feed their, their, their families. So quite a lot is happening at Shashe. We, uh, we, we, we say, yes, lockdown is, is too bad, but also on the other side, the lockdown has given us a very big opportunity, especially right now, uh, if I was in my garden, I tell you, oh. I tell you, I have managed to grow more than enough of vegetables, which I was not expecting. and. A few of people are coming to buy or else if I have some time, I also get my cows or my donkeys, the, the cut, then take to the nearest the business center where people are also uh, happy to buy my agroecologically produced uh, products. So I think this is very, very important for us to know that the lockdown has some opportunities, although they are also a, a big disadvantage process to the rest of the families. But otherwise, at Shashe, things are just moving as usual, regardless of being few or being a little in numbers. We are managing to see that we produce enough to feed the families and we keep on the work of agroecology uh, being practiced every time. So this is what I just wanted to share in a nutshell, briefly. Okay, thank you, Mama, uh, for that, Mama Elizabeth, for those who are uh, your dear friends. Uh, count you as a dear friend. Uh, folks, that's all we have time for today. This was a lovely discussion. Thank you for all our panelists, our interviewees, for being here with us, for your time, for your insights. Uh, please, to those of you out there watching live or watching later, you are with us. Please leave your comment, your like, and share this video and follow our Facebook pages. We'll put the links in the descriptions below. Uh, as we say in Via Campesina, we feed the people and build the movement to change the world. Put sovereignty now. It's time to transform. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you.